you're saying is, what I got is, we don't take possession of what He has given to us. And it's all for our taking, uh, and He hands it to us, and yet we say, Lord, give it to me, give it to me. Why didn't it happen? Why? Well, you haven't possessed it in your heart. It's, it's mental agreement, and, and what you were before is mental faith. You agree, but when you possess it in your heart, it's, I already have it. I just, I just have it. Yes. Amen. And, and, right. You have the faith of the Son of God in you, and He helps you to develop into your own faith. Yeah, exactly. And so even Paul stated when uh, I came in preaching to you in fear and trembling, he came in his weakness and he discovered God's grace and power was even stronger when he was weak. And so it was then the Lord's faith working through him. And so really you have, we have no excuse because our supply is unlimited. Our grace, you know, it, it's, it's the word charis in the, in the Greek. And it, it was, Paul used a pagan word to describe what God did for us. The word charis meant touched by the gods. But he, he related it to us meaning we are touched by God, not just in the gifts of the Spirit, but our calling as well. And it's... Uh, and every time you see grace in the Bible, it means charis. It means God has given gifts, ministry gifts, gifts of the Spirit, but also gifts that are unique to you. And this is, you know, you discover this as you, as you uh, go along and you develop your faith in Christ. And, of course, your faith develops as you are obedient to the Word. Which get, brings us to our offering message. Amen. <laughs> Lord, thank you for the Word and the Spirit, Lord, that you, we dedicate the service to you. You have your way here tonight as you please. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Just on a side note, just kind of come to me. The Holy Spirit is the, the Spirit of truth who leads us into the truth. We, we all know that here. And I'm sure a lot of the people online may know that as well. Um, but... We get Matthew 7, verse 7, where he talks about ask, seek, knock. Ask the Holy Spirit questions. Just ask Him all the time questions. How does this work? How do, how, what do you think? Or like with me, I'll ask Him, what do you think of how I preach the Word? Or what do you think about this? Should this change or is it okay? Just ask Him questions all the time. And he, He'll answer you. And this is part of the answered prayer. It's like, even ask Him if something doesn't get answered in prayer. Why didn't this happen? Was it my faith? Was it a lack of? Was it my lack of development? Or was it an operator error is what I'm asking. Because I know he always works, amen. He always works. The, the Word of God always works. But why didn't this come to pass? Ask him. Because when you get answered prayer, your joy, your, your joy is what? Full. Amen. And so you stay in that place of full. He wants you to have answered prayers, but he wants you to ask the right way. He wants to ask according to the Word of God and not according to our own lusts. That way our prayers can get answered. Amen. We start thinking and acting like the Lord. And growing up into Him. Uh, last Sunday we talked about waiting on the Lord. And I want to do a small review, even though this is uh, Thursday. But I want to talk about we must, we talked about we must wait on the Lord. Which waiting means what? Being in the anointing. Praise God. Studying the Word of God. Learning how to live in the presence of God. Waiting doesn't just mean fiddle your thumbs and wait for a certain time for God to do something in your life. Waiting means you're preparing yourself, and the Lord will bring it to you to whatever you're believing for or waiting on. Uh, he'll bring it to pass. And sometimes He'll say, you know, Lord, I'm ready for ministry. I'm ready to go out. And He may say, wait. You know, I felt like I was ready after Ramah to go out and to be a pastor or to do something. And He said, wait, serve here. And He said, wait, serve here. So while I'm waiting, I'm still serving the Lord. I'm still moving with Him. I'm still moving with God while I'm waiting on God. He's waiting in His presence. And so you, you have to move with Him. You always have to be advancing in and developing your faith. You always have to be developing in spiritual things. Because uh, if you're not doing these things, I mean, you should gauge your life. Even one month ago, by one month, you should have grown in something in the Word of God. In six months, you can look back and say, yeah, I've really grown in understanding and wisdom of the Word. Praise God. Uh, I've under, in knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, I've grown in these areas. Praise God. Well, you're doing good. Because if you're ten years and still in the same spot, that's an indictment against you. Amen. And, and oftentimes, this is, 
will lead the backsliding because God's always moving. He's always doing a move. And what I'm saying here is when we... 1 Samuel chapter 3 is where I want you to turn. 1 Samuel 3, God's always moving, always doing something in the earth. He's always, he, he never, if those who stay close to Him in His presence, who learn how to stay in the anointing, who learn how to stay in the Word, and the Word and Spirit are the same thing, you really cannot divide the two. You see the distinction, but you see that it is the Word that always brings the Spirit. And some people say, well, I'm a worshiper. Well, yeah, so am I, but I understand what you're saying. You're just saying that God's called you maybe to be a worshiper, but you, what you're really saying is, well, I'm a worshiper. All I have to do is worship and not stay in the Word of God. That's wrong. That's wrong. Because if you get into that area where all you do is worship, and yeah, your answers can get met in the anointing, which we talked about last week of 1 John chapter 2, the anointing that abideth in you. Praise God for the anointing, because the Word is anointed, but to have the anointing without the Word of God is, is really not possible. And what you're saying is, I just spend time worshiping Him. I'm telling you, your worship goes to another level when it's based on the Word. Because the anointing, the Word, the Spirit are the exact same thing. They move together, praise God, and you can really not dissect, you can't have one and not the other, amen. Because if, if all you try to do is live by the Word without the Spirit, it's dead. It's a dead letter, and you become legalistic. And if all you try to do is worship or be, led of the, or, or be in the Spirit without the Word, you get off into goofy things. You're not grounded. You'll get into weird doctrines. You just, it, it cannot be. It cannot be. Amen. And so, well, everything has a time and a season. But I believe, from what I see in my spirit, that we're in a new era of the church, not a new season. A new era is like a new age. It affects everything. Everything. You, we've seen this in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. It's like the same things repeat over and over. Well, a new era would be uh, God the Father getting everything ready just before He sent His Son. When His Son came, new era. You know what I'm saying? And then when His Son finished and the Holy Spirit came, New era. It was what? Something so powerful and so different. The old to the new can be compared as that. But we see 1 Samuel 3, how this season, and it says, and the child Samuel, now in chapter 2, he spent, he slept by the Ark of the Covenant. He slept by the anointing. He knew the anointing. He knew the presence of God. And then the Lord called him out, praise God. The Lord called him out in chapter 3. And he no longer just knew the presence or about God. He knew God. And, and to be... You see, God is doing an awesome work in the church today. And before He comes, He has to get those who are listening to the Spirit and the Word ready for Him. He has to get them ready. Amen? Because a lot of us, even now, and I see it, God is getting a lot of churches ready. Which is why the reason why a lot of churches are shrinking is because he has marked those that will listen to his spirit and those who will not. These will step into the move of God in the final days. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord. He was a child and he ministered unto the Lord. A lot of grown Christians don't do that. And I say grown, quote unquote. Before Eli, what he ministered before the Lord, serving Eli. There's a message in there. And the word of the Lord was precious or rare in those days. And there was no open vision. Well, it seemed like things were drying up. And you read in chapter 2, God had sent <coughs> what it calls a man of God in verse 27, 1 Samuel 2.27, unto Eli. That is the word for a prophet. God sent a prophet to Eli. God always has a remnant. Always. And if Elijah, who cried out, who wanted to die because of Ahab, <coughs> because of Jezebel, he wanted to die, he wanted to take his life. He was backslidden for six months. Did you know that? Six months he ran away from his call. He ran away, and that was just before he went to the mount of God. 
the mountain. And God confronted him and he showed him great signs in the earth. He showed him the earthquake. He showed him all these raging things and it says God was not in it. But the still small voice, that's what he was in. Why was he running? Persecution. He got in the flesh. He got afraid. He stopped trusting God. <clears throat> and for a man like that to happen, it could happen to anyone. Eli lost his office, his priestly office. It would have continued down his line, but he loved his sons more than he loved the Lord. He says, do you love me more than these? Why, he would not judge his sons. And that's when God sent a prophet. This no-named prophet comes out of nowhere and talks to Eli. God always has a remnant. And God spoke to Elijah, I have 7,000 that will not bow their, their knee to Baal. I have 7,000. If you fail, I'll send someone else. And he had a powerful call in his life. And God had grace and mercy. Through those six months, he came to him, not in anger. He says, hey, come on back, is basically what he was doing. Come on back. Six months of, of running. And he finally, God got his attention. It was like, it's not in the big dramatic things which the enemy will often try to scare us with, but it's by the sweet whisper of God Himself. The still, small voice. That's what you listen to. It's the peace, amen, that leads us. We must hear. We must have ears to hear what God is speaking. Because the world is, is loud. And the world is distracting. And not to say that God doesn't put on a show. Oh, He will. Amen. He'll put on a big show. But those who are led by the Spirit are of a different breed. They're of a different quality. They're, they're not your average Christian that knows of God. They know Him personally. Amen. Elijah was one of them. Even though God had grace on him for six months after running away, Jonah was different because he was so rebellious that God quickly judged him. Even the major prophets, <laughs> rebellion in their heart, a major prophet had rebellion. Praise God for His grace. Amos, A-M-O-S. This is near, right next to Jonah, right next to Micah. It's one of the minor prophets. Amos 8.11, it says, Behold the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of what? Hearing the words of the Lord. We're in one of those famines today. All the churches that it, uh, past. Pastor Jay I've talked to just became a pastor. Other ministers I've talked to. It's like God is shrinking the churches because He will have those who will truly listen to Him. But what is He doing? And it's the same thing that has cycled around for generations and generations and it's coming back to a head like it is now. There's a famine of the Word of God and then God sends a revelation. God sends a move. God gets those people, the remnant ready. Praise God. And those who what? You get Ezekiel chapter 9. He says, mark those who cry for the temple, who what? Intercede for the land. Mark them on their foreheads. See, God, you see, there's a marking where even in the last days, the angels go out and they mark those who will be raptured. They mark those who are wheat and not thistles. Amen. And so, I believe, you know, the few that we have here, or even that come, I believe that we're marked. I believe this church is marked. Amen. And we're growing in the grace of God. But these are the times in which things will happen quickly. Amen. They'll happen quickly. Verse 13 of chapter 9 of Amos says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the trender of grapes that sow a seed in the mountains shall drop sweet wine and the hills shall melt. Everything that has been sown into this world of different ministers faithful to the Word of God, men and women who have served and have brought revelation down from heaven, is for our taking. And praise God, I've grown from lots of different ministers. But also, 
their seed still in this earth, waiting for God to give the increase. If you can have an idea of what this last awakening, because we're at the end, and I, I hear it in my spirit so clearly, it continue, we're at the end. He says, well, that's preached for a while. I'll say it again. We're at the end of the end. <laughs> we're at the end of it all. Amen. We're at the end of it all. And it's ready or not, here I come. That's the Lord. And those who hear will hear it. Ready or not, here I come. And he, he's what, like with Elijah, backslidden. Hey, come on. And Elijah, yeah, Elijah, come on, come on, come on, come on. And he finally answered, good, you answered, you're back, praise God. It's like the Lord is doing that to those who hear. The prodigal son was eaten with the pigs and came back to himself. Amen. God has mercy. But if you're going to be used in these last days, then you have to be in the place where God has called you and you have to hear what the Spirit is saying to the seven churches, or all the churches now, that will have an ear to hear. Praise God. There is a place we have to get to before Jesus comes back, and by His mercy and compassion and grace, He gets us there. We cry out to Him, He gets us there. Why? Right? Because the time is now, and it just seems like it's so easy to advance in spiritual things. It's like, it's like, the last year, or really the last four months, I have been advancing more than I ever have in my entire life. And I believe it's going to be the same for you. Why? Because now's the time. That's why. Now is the time. Ephesians 5. And really what's going to happen is, is when we see Jesus in all His glory, when we see Him come, we're going to give Him glory because we're going to see His hand was upon us as I could have done nothing to, I could have done nothing without your grace and mercy and your hand leading me and your hand upon me. I could have done nothing. Amen. You're going to see it. And you're just going to give glory to God. And, and the rapture, I believe personally, is that we're going to get so much revelation of God's love and walk in so much power that it's like we're just going to transition. Just boom. Enoch was so close to God that God basically said, you're closer to my house than you are yours. Why don't you come up here? And then boom, transition. Amen. That is what's going to be. All the revivals you can put in from, from the history of church history to what's happened in the book of Acts, you'll get an idea of what's going to happen. And this, may, this revival, I believe, will be years. Gathering up by His grace, as many as He can. As many as will listen. Amen. But the ones who listen now in the dry seasons, who get their roots down deep into the Word of God, to where they can still get nutrients in the dry seasons, where they still hear God's voice, when it seems like there's a famine in the land, will be used in the revival. Mightily. Amen. And there it is. Praise God. You have to be where God calls you to be. Ephesians 5. And you have to submit. <laughs> There's that submission. Praise God. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and what gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify it and cleanse it with what? The washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle. Amen? And at, what, at the end it says, Be holy and without blemish. And he relates it to husbands loving their wives. And a lot of Christians would still be married if they just did that. And not just saying, you know, it takes two to tango in a marriage. But what God is relating it here is, it's the Word that cleanses you. It cleanses a perverse thinking. It cleanses your, your spirit. Word and Spirit are the same thing. Amen. And, and, and you move, praise God. You have the infilling of the Holy Ghost, which what? He always speaks of Jesus. It increases the Word. You see, you see the distinction between the two, but when you really look at it, they're so intertwined, you can't see where one begins and where one ends. They're, they're so interwoven together. Just like the Trinity. You see God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They each have their own function, but they're so intertwined and so in unity that they're considered one. Elohim, the plural, the Godhead. 
And so, praise God. Word and Spirit are coming to our revelation, praise God, to our understanding that this is what's going to stand out. Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to give a little more clarity on this. Galatians 3, verse 1 says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has evidently set forth crucified among you? Now this is verse 2 states, This only would I learn of you, receive you the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's, that's Romans uh, ten seventeen, I believe. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by the Word of God. And how do we receive the Spirit? By the hearing of faith. Amen? How did you know that you could get filled with the Holy Spirit? By the hearing of the Word of God. It was there presented to you. And what true, true, true faith, amen, is a spiritual force, a force that you see in the Word of God and you have it right now. As you say, we have it now. Amen. And when you possess it, you own a library, you own books, but do you know and possess what's in that book till you read it, even though you own it? It's the same thing with the blessings of God and entering into His presence. You don't possess your possessions as the oxymoron of this, that this is. You don't possess your possessions until you read it and you, pos- well, you possess it. Amen. It gets in you is when you possess it. And mental agreement... Well, I, I agree that Jesus is the Son of God, and yet I still think you're going to hell. Why? Because you don't believe that in your heart. It hasn't reached your heart. It's like you're making an excuse. Well, I believe in God. Well, yeah, well so do the devils. And they fear. There's nothing they can do about it. Faith, amen, is of the Spirit, is of the heart. It's His faith developing your faith. So you see how God's hand is in everything helping you. He has literally put you on a, a tricycle with training wheels holding you as you, as you uh, develop in this. Amen. He is the perfect coach. The Holy Spirit is here on the earth helping us. And Jesus is in the heavenlies which we're also connected to Him interceding for us. Our adversary. You know why the devil is so against the Word of God? Because who else would know its power than the one that knew him in glory before he got cast down? The devil knows his power. The devil knows when God speaks, it's power. And if he can blind you from that, of you becoming a potential voice for God, where you echo and you speak that voice, and it has that dynamic power, he's going to do what? 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Everything in his power to blind you from the truth. Everything he can to blind you or to twist it. If he can twist your thinking, he can potentially nullify it or change it into something else that has no power. And what we know that as? Religion. Amen. The form of God. No power. It's a mockery. You have to be set free from these things. Verse 5 of Galatians 3. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How do I enter in? How do I produce miracles? By the hearing of faith, which is what? The Word of God. Which, according to Galatians 5, faith works by love. The Holy Spirit in Romans 5.5 5, sheds the, the love of God in your heart. You develop in love with your relationship with Him. It will uplift faith. You know God's mercy. It will ra- raise your faith sky high and it what the Spirit will produce miracles. Amen. Miracles. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. Verse 14 states, 
that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You have to possess your possessions. You have to hear. You must hear the Word of God. You must hear it. You must be in the place of hearing. You must be right next to Him. And even if you're hearing, Jesus questioned, you know, how's your hearing? Be careful what you hear. Now that you're in the place to hear, what must you also check? Your mind, it must be renewed. You must have the right kind of hearing. Revelation 2. And the first warning that the disciples asked Jesus, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? If it says world, it means age in your Bible. What is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And he said, be careful that you're not deceived. Be careful what you hear. Why? Because the enemy has given all his attention to corrupt this word of God and to give you a different Jesus, which is the spirit of Antichrist. And if he can give you a different Jesus than the one that has an everlasting eternal effect, then he has neutralized you. He says, I can't outrightly attack this thing because it's too powerful. I have to weave in and sow a little discord. I have to weave in and, and twist with a little lie or question or doubt. I have to weave in, and it took him generations to perfect his game to where just if I can just get them off one or two degrees out of being on the straight and narrow, the perfect path, preaching the, the Christ that saves, eventually, maybe four or five years, six, seven, eight years, they'll be nullified. That's how powerful the word is. Just a little just a little dab of deception will do you. But if you have an ear that hears, you'll recognize these things. And you'll be in a council of people, of men and women of God that will come up to you and say, hey, that's not right. We don't believe that. What do you mean? Here's why. What? They're helping you. Amen? Revelations 2.7. This is when he's talking to the seven churches. What does he say? And he says this many times throughout this. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Jesus said that. The Word of God said that. The Word says, hear what the Spirit is saying. And the Spirit says, what does He say? I only speak about the Lord. I only speak about the Word. The two together, amen? Hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You see, Jesus left this earth thousands of years ago. But we are His presence, the church in this earth. Or two or three are gathered together in my name, what the Holy Spirit is in the midst of you. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ is there. I mean, that's what he meant when I'm in the midst of you. How can he be in the midst of you if he's in heaven? The Spirit of God. Amen? You are his voice. You are his light. You are his salt. You have his faith. My God, he's empowered you to never fail. So and how do we fail? The devil gets us to open the door for him. The devil gets us to compromise ourselves. He has to twist our thinking so that we destroy ourselves. But when we really see what the truth of the Word of God is, that He is the way, the truth, and the life, that He is the light of life, that He is the love of God, the truth sets you free. And those who have been in darkness for so long and twisted in their mind, they just they either shy away from it or they just can't accept it. They had a choice to, but what? They just say, like, I've been wrong for all these years. I don't want to change the way I am. Everyone will have their excuse. And at the end of days, when they're brought before the judgment seat, the great white throne judgment, and this is after the thousand year reign of Jesus. So even after Jesus comes back, and a thousand years he's purging this earth from all the wickedness that happened creating it exactly like God intended for it. At the end of those thousand years is the great white throne judgment. They'll still have time to repent. Can you believe that? And some won't. And many won't. Nations won't. I can't believe that. But they won't. And when they come, when they come before Him and the books are opened, 
It says books. Plural. I believe there's going to be a book of conscience. It says, hey, this kept warning you, and you would not listen. My spirit kept warning you, and you would not listen. There's no excuse. And for those who come to him with no excuse, he receives. Amen. No excuse for your sin. No excuse for not living to the fullness. Because now, let's, let's just take the sin factor out of this. Because most believers know that Jesus died for their sin. Amen. You'd have to to be saved. Then what is the other factor that we're talking about? Excuses of why you're not living in the fullness. For John chapter 1 talks about how we live in the fullness. How he, we saw Him and He was the fullness. Let's turn there. We have received of His fullness. But many people do not live in the fullness. Verse 16. John 1.16 And of His fullness we all, and have all we received and grace or grace for the law of Moses for the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. This fullness, John 1.16 and of His fullness have all we received. And yet many of us live short of that fullness. Sin will keep you living less than what God intended. And I'm not talking about the sins that took you to hell. I'm, taking, I'm talking about you and the, the great fullness of God. The great fullness of Jesus where your face shines like His face on the Mount of Transfiguration. Where your life is so full, amen, and you're not empty or lonely. But how does that come when the body of Christ corporately loves one another? And Lois, praise God, I saw that Sunday where we loved on you. Amen. That's what it's about. Receiving that fullness. I saw one time Pastor Hagen at Ramah. I don't remember why. It was many years ago. But he was feeling down. Something happened. I, I think it was shortly after his mother passed away. And the whole church came and hugged on him. And he was bawling. I've seen a man so strong like that. He was just bawling. And the love of God was just filling him up. That's what it's about. That's the fullness. And when you're in the deep presence of God, it grips your heart. And you're just with compassion. You feel His mercy and you're in tears just, just crying out, I want to know you more. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've given me. You're being filled up. Amen. Many of us know this account, but I want to go back to it so we see it again. I believe no matter how many times we go to a chapter and verse, turn to Acts 2, there's always something more to learn. The Spirit can always show us something more because we have ears to hear. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my maidservants will I pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And he talks about, I'll show wonders. Amen. In verse 21, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on Jesus. I'm telling you, when you have the Word undiluted, the Spirit and the Word, they sink back and forth with one another. It's not just, I'm just a worshiper. All my job is to do is just worship and stay in the presence. That's an indictment because the Word, the Holy Spirit always talks about the Word of God. And the Word of God, undiluted, always brings you to the place of the Spirit. Amen. And faith is a spiritual food, a spiritual force. It is the force of love working in you and through you. To what? How do you know that you're healed? Because I know God loves me, that's why. God loves me, that's why I'm healed. Because I don't see it. You don't have to see it. I've possessed it in my spirit. I already have it. Manifestation is not long away. Amen. And so, again, the man in Ironwood, his name was Tim ministered to him on healing for about five months. And in the, in, the, in the week before he got it, he says, I don't know why I'm not. I just know I have it. And he was at such a rest. He said, I just know I have it. Laid hands on him that Sunday. Nothing to it. He doesn't need crutches anymore. Praise God. 
He possessed it. What had to happen? The renewing of his mind. The Word of God did that. You have to possess your possessions. You, and that is the only way to do it is by hearing and knowing that, that and staying in the anointing because they work together. Amen. They work together. And you can ask the Lord, Lord, why don't I feel the anointing in my house? Why don't I feel the anointing in my room? Why don't I carry the tangible anointing? Ask Him. He'll tell you. Because you get to the place, this is where everyone needs to be, is that you get to the place where you know the voice of God. You know how to get the answers. What did James chapter 1 say? Turn with me there. James 1, and you have to understand that they went through a terrible, and I'll say it again, terrible persecution. They were eaten by lions. This is the time of great persecutions in the church. And you know, James was killed by being thrown over a cliff, the same cliff, or the same place where Satan took Jesus above the temple. There was a cliff over there. And they cast him down. And he went down preaching the word, and he fell down and did not die. They had to kill him when they found him at the bottom. And that during these times of great persecution, <laughs> They asked him, James, we're dying. What do we do? We're, we're being killed. And then in verse 5, he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and they give it to all men freely and liberally, and hold it up not, and it shall be given to him. What is he saying? Have you asked God? What do we do? Have you asked God? That's what he said. Have you asked God? And, and if someone asks me, what do I do? Did you ask God? I may have a word, I may not. I may be moved by the Spirit, I may not. What God may be saying is, now is the time that you, yourself, know Him. You know His voice. You ask Him questions, amen. We have to, we can't, we are long past the time of knowing Him generally. We have to know Him specifically. We have to know Him personally, amen. I'm not just talking about a personal Savior because everyone in this room has that revelation. And many online have that revelation. But do you know have the revelation that he, that he will answer every single question you have? Do you know how the, when you don't know that you should know, did you know you can pray in other tongues till you do know and, and it will lead you to wearing the word to hear from him? Do you know that? You get so confident. Amen. And then when you come to service, he says, I'm just here to worship God. And I start speaking by the Spirit of God. And it's like, that's what God was telling me four days ago. That's what God was ministering to me four days ago. And it's like, but it adds to it. Amen. See, the grace is there for every single level. The babes get milk. The spiritually mature get meat. And you go on from there. Amen. But there should always be the confirmation and witness of the Spirit. Do you remember the first time you got saved? How you were so in love with the Word of God. How everything was just speaking to you. Why did that leave? It never has to leave. That never has to leave. That closeness never has to go. I love holding my baby, baby Eve. Most of the time she's happy. Jumping up and down. We love to look at each other. But it's like as kids grow up, they seem to want less of that. Not that you hold them and giggle with them the exact same way, but you enjoy each other's presence. That's the way it's always meant to be. I can't speak to baby Eve like I can speak to my three and five year old. But they, they get deeper relationship. They grow in deeper things. They understanding. It's the same thing with God and you. Never leave that place where it's a joy to be in this Word because if you get bored with this Word, it means you have not been looking at God lately. It means you have not been receiving of Him lately. And the seraphim, they fly around the throne and they, they're called burning ones. They burn because they see God. They see His radiant face. And they cry, holy, holy, holy. That should be our cry. Holy, you get in this word, say, oh, it's so good. I missed this. <laughs> you know, I've only been gone four or five hours and to do my thing, happen to work. But when you got back, this is what you're thinking about. And you're consumed with it. Amen. You live it. You become it. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about what the hall, we call it the, the hall of fame of faith. Because what? It talks about men of faith who stood. It talks about 
even women of faith who stood for God? Did you know and understand what I'm saying? That God is still writing Hebrews chapter 11, me and you. God is still writing that. And when we get before him, he's going to what, continue to tell of those who stood in faith. And we may be in there, praise God. That'd be awesome. Amen. My, my delight is to serve him. My delight is, is to be whatever he wants me to be, to be a vessel in the, in the earth for him, to rest in the anointing, to rest in his presence. God is not amused or moved by numbers. I'm not saying that because we have a small church. I've had to learn that because we've had a small church. <laughs> but what? You see in John chapter 6, he dismissed over 5,000 people. He says, I don't want you guys. You guys have the wrong heart. Have you ever seen a pastor and as a point out over, let's say you have a 2,000 congregation, takes 1,000 of them and says, you guys don't want it. You can leave. <laughs> That's what Jesus did. He says, you are not here for the right reason. And they left him. And he turned to his staff. Will you leave me too? His twelve. He said, I'll do this. I'll do this with or without you. You're supposed to be with me. He says, where will we go? We have given everything. You're the one with eternal life. You are the Son of God. You, we've given everything. And there's the price. To follow Him. To be led of the Spirit. And to continually get life for the Word of God. Is you have to give everything. Nothing can be in between you and God. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Jonah chapter 2 states those who observe lying vanities or in the Amplified says idols forsake their own mercy. That's the call in your life. That's the mercies of God over your life. If an idol gets between you and the Lord, it's not immediate, but you begin to forsake your own mercies. There's a time to repent. Like Elijah Chapter 6, but you know there's coming a time after, the, after God marks people and says, all right, now I've got to divide. There's a time when God has to divide. And you see it in Romans chapter 1. People who continually give themselves over to sin, he what in judgment stops moving upon them and they become that thing. They become it. He gives them over to it. You have... God is so merciful and so loving, but we have a choice. We cannot let anything get between us and God. Nothing. Hallelujah. Where was I? Uh, X6. Amen. X6, verse 7. Well, In Acts chapter 6, they, the apostles talk to the congregation. It says, Choose seven among you, full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. Verse, this is starting in verse 3. Full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, or to become deacons, is what he was saying. Deacons were servants. They served the church. That was their only function. So biblically speaking, deacons that run on a board and govern church government is not biblical. They are meant to serve tables and wait on the people. <laughs> Anyways, different story. Whatever. Um, verse 6 states, Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So these seven that got chose, the apostles laid their hands on them. And then what happened? Because these people were full of the Holy Ghost. And the Word of God increased. And the Word of God increased. People full of the Holy Ghost and God told them, lay your hands on them, appoint them. And then the word increased. You understand, you stay full of the Spirit. If you, are in, if you are doing it right, the word will increase. When the increase of the word happens in the people of the church, when the Spirit of God is moving, the word of God will increase. What They get the vision, they get the fire as, hey, I've got a job to do. Hey, I can help this way. Hey, the Lord is upon me. And they go and spread the word. They go and the word increases in the church. But God also gives the increase too. And then it says in verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, 
So not only was he full of the Holy Ghost, but he was full of faith, which comes by the hearing of the word, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You've got to get full. Amen. Say full. Full. Amen. Well, Jude verse 1, or excuse me, Jude chapter 1 verse 20 says, uh, stirring up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen? You see how all this goes hand in hand? <laughs> and that's what you begin to see when you spend more time in the Word of God. It's all hand in hand. There's a connection between all of it. There are patterns in the world between everything. And, and you see the pattern. And what happened? The Israelites wandered in circles 40 years because they had no faith. And they were called out of Egypt. They got, basically put it in our terms, they got saved, brought out of the world. But faith never entered their heart. You see people in the same way in this life. It never becomes spirit. And what happens? They wander in the same sin. They wander in the same, the same pattern of life, making the same mistakes. God what resists the proud but gives more grace unto the humble. He says, I'll wait for their children to be raised up. Those are the ones I'll bring into the promise. They had faith. Egypt was not out of them. They wanted to go back too. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Thank you, Jesus, for the Spirit of God and the Word of God moving on us. Brings us out of the cycles of death and life. Bring breaks. What you're going to walk the straight and narrow doesn't mean it means you're not going to walk the the jagged, crooked that leads what in the same thing. He breaks the mold. He breaks the cycle of death in your life. We ask Jesus. He, you come with no excuse in all your mess. And you say, Jesus, help me, Holy Spirit, help me. And I make no excuse for my life. He says, Welcome. I will minister. I will be your life. Make no excuse for God. Make no excuse. Amen. Praise God. This is a good one. Matthew 25. I believe the Lord has delayed His coming because of mercy's sake. I believe He has delayed His coming because He wants the most to be marked. He wants the most to be saved. Matthew 25, we'll start in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So this bridegroom is Christ, amen? And remember, the church is represented as the bride of Christ. So who would be the, who would be the, the virgins? Well, those who are pure, amen? If you're pure and washed by the blood of the Lamb, then you are a bride for Christ. I know that's weird for men to accept. <laughs> And five of them were wise and five were foolish. I want to be a wise Christian for the Lord. And the foolish took, excuse me, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. That tells me they did not stay full. They did not stay in the place of the anointing and hearing even though they knew the Lord. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried, waited, what does it say? They all slumbered. All of them slumbered. We have gotten to the point in the church where even God's elect have slumbered. Not that they're unfaithful. That's not what it means. But God has tarried for His second coming. God has waited. And what? We faithfully waiting and waiting and waiting See, the time that the Lord comes is a time when people will say, well, He's not coming. He's an, even, his faith, even the ones that belong to Him says, well, He delayeth His coming. He is right there. Ready or not, here He comes. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, Go you out to meet him. He's waiting at the, at the last possible time before this new 
time of the second coming, right at midnight, the longest he could wait. The longest he could wait. Are you full of the Word and Spirit? Do you have an extra vial of oil for your lamp of waiting faithfully for the Lord? There's a crown of those who expect His coming. There's a crown of the overcomer. But there's a crown for those who faithfully wait on the Lord and expect His coming. Amen. Because it's going to get to that point. It's, it's getting to that point where rewards will be given for waiting. For waiting. Hallelujah. The Word of God was rare. Oh, but don't worry. Don't worry. Praise God. Don't worry one single bit. What is it? Was that famous saying? It's darkest just before dawn. <laughs> just before the, the move of God, it seems like everything's drying up. And what the enemy kind of builds his confidence is the same thing. When, when God, it was like, he wasn't silent. They call it 400 silent years before Malachi in the New Testament. He wasn't silent. He was preparing everything. He was letting the powers of darkness, what they were already into the temple worship, they were already had interweaven into the Pharisees and Sadducees. The enemy had was strongest in, this, in the Jews' religion. And then the seed became manifest. You see, the seed of God's Word was in the earth for waiting for the perfect time before it became flesh. God uses the same principles He teaches us. Amen? Faith, waiting, planting seed, harvest. The harvest came, and it was a light in great darkness. It was a brilliant light in thick darkness. And it showed us the perfect way. And what was the reaping was us into a new era, praise God, of knowing Him. And it's the same thing happening all over again. I mean, we know Him so much more than they could have known Him in the Old Testament. But now, when His appearing comes, we'll know Him so much more than we ever thought possible. He's, he'll be right there. Mm, he'll be right there. The time is now. Jesus knew. He was our type and example. He knew His call. Do you know yours? Do you know your place? Ask God. Luke 4. Luke chapter 4. Verse 1, And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, so Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. The, the other six besides Stephen in Acts chapter 6 were full of the Holy Ghost. It's only because Jesus <laughs> led the example. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So he, fate, he, went to, he went into fasting, full of the Spirit. And when the enemy thought he was weakest, he attacked him and was defeated in the wilderness, and he came out with power. And uh, defeated him again. And when the enemy thought he had him at the cross, when he was weakest, it was when he got defeated the worst. And when we see the church that it may be, quote-unquote, the weakest, <laughs> it's when the Son of God truly, what, it'll manifest, and those who are waiting in the gusher that it'll gush out will be in it. Amen? Verse 14 says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit in the Galilee. But then we see Him state His call in verse 18. He says what? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He, went, he did this in every synagogue. He told them this. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted. Amen. To preach the Gospel to the poor. That is not talking about money, which it may include people who are poor. It's not talking about money. What's it talking about? Poor in spirit. Matthew chapter 5, the first Beatitudes is, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit, He is right there to fill you up. He is John chapter 4, the well of everlasting water, which we talked about on Sunday. This woman had five husbands. The person she was, not, she was living with now was not her husband, so she was a fornicator, maybe in an adultery as well. And she was a half-Jew, so she had, people were prejudiced against her. And he revealed himself to her, and she was so satisfied 
And he was so satisfied by her worship. That is what God does with us. It's the communion between us and him. He is satisfied with our worship. And he loves to satisfy our soul with himself. And how you properly receive is from the spirit of worship. Word and spirit. And to heal the broken heart. He sent me to heal. He cares about those who are broken hearted. If you're going to do the works of God, you can't have a limp in your spirit. You can't be broken. He's going to make you whole. You're broken to your flesh, but you're whole in spirit. You're broken to your own ways. That's why Moses could not lead when he was 40 years old because he healed the Egyptian because he was still strong in the arm of his flesh. He killed the Egyptian. He says, I thought you would know that I was called to deliver you. He knew his call. But he was still not strong in being obedient to the Lord. It took another 40 years to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He said it with boldness. He said it with power. The power of the Holy Ghost was upon him. All of you are mighty in the Lord and have mighty calls, but so few people ever step into their calling. I'm not in the final stages of my call. This is still part of training. Moses, 40 years in the wilderness, was still part of training until, what, 80 years old, he stepped into the fullness of what God called him to, to lead Israel out of Egypt and to give them. He had an awesome relation with God. No one at that time besides Adam, even Abraham, knew God like Moses did. Awesome. Enoch was different. His ministry was special, and so much so that he got rapture. I don't really understand the wonders of Enoch. When we get... And you may well know this world, and you may not. You may be like that man from Samuel chapter 2, just called the man who went to Eli, the high priest, and brought correction. God will use anyone who sits to him. Do you have ears to hear? Is what the Spirit is saying. Are you in the place to receive the possessions that God has freely given to you? Because He cries out for you. He loves you so much. He cries out for you. He, he sings over you. He loves, he loves who you are. It's a holy communion. Why did Jesus die on the cross? And many will say, well, because of sin. Sin was in the way. Yeah, he, he came to defeat the works of the devil. That's why He was manifest. But why? For you. For communion. He loves you. He loves your face. He loves, <laughs> he loves who you are. His thoughts for you are so marvelous. But He wants you more than you want to know the Lord. He wants you to know Him. I want, I want to spend time with you. Luke 18. Verse 8, And I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Shall he find the ones waiting on him? Shall he find those who are ready, who are doing the work? Shall he find the faithful on the earth? I believe I'll be one of those people. Praise God. I, I say that in humbleness and humility. But it's what it, it will continually cost you everything to follow him. Do you love your children, your parents, your mother, your father more than God? Then you will not qualify. It doesn't mean you won't make heaven. But you will not be in the place that God wants you to be. Pay the price. Because he, he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the one that brings you through every single thing. And as for a reference, Romans 12 one through two, the renewing of the Word of God, amen, brings you into that place. Ephesians 3.19 states how Paul was praying that the love of God passes knowledge. It's not the knowledge of the Bible that saves you or brings you to the fullness. 
It's knowing the love of God that brings you into revelation. That's Ephesians 3.19. The love of God goes beyond knowledge. The foolishness of preaching saves you. Amen? The foolishness of teaching the Word that this world would call foolish. It's beyond knowledge. How do you go beyond knowledge? Well, the world can't understand it. But we of the Spirit do. We of the Spirit are beyond knowledge. Because... Knowledge has its facts, but you understand that knowledge only knows what it can see. Faith knows beyond the sight realm. Faith knows of the Spirit of God into the dimensions it has not been yet because it's been there with the Lord. It has been there in which it has not seen with the natural eye, but of the Spirit. You go into places you could not possibly go in the area of faith. By knowing the love, the Word, and the Spirit. Even in Ephesians 3.1, Paul states how this was made unto me by revelation. Amen. By revelation. The Holy Spirit always lifts up the glorified Christ. He always lifts up Jesus glorified in the Word. Jesus was in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, the types and shadows, the seed of the woman. Amen. Every single book of the Bible has a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. And of the fullness we live, we live now in the New Testament, we see His face. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18 says, What face to face, amen, as in a mirror we see Him. As in a mirror we see Him. The day is coming we will no longer look through the mirror. John the Baptist was a prototype. He was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Why? Look at his birth, how unique it was. He was filled with the Spirit of God before he was born. He met Jesus in the womb. He was born not into iniquity. He, he knew God when he was born. Can you imagine? And yet, he was an Old Testament prophet. But he was a prototype because he had something they did not. I believe more prototypes are coming that it would be like the, the people. They, they see something from the other side. They see something from the other side. And it, what, it, it's to shine and give testimony of what is to come. And we get so full of God then all of a sudden the rapture won't be I mean, yeah, he's coming suddenly as a thief in the night, but I personally believe that those who stay very close to the Lord, it'll be no surprise to them. It's just, he's here. Amen. He's here. And then we're with him in the clouds. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time and day. Thank you, Lord, so much for your awesome grace and anointing. Those online, give your life to Jesus. Accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be filled with the Spirit of God. I thank you that none of what I preach that was of you, Lord, would fall to the ground. That it will bear fruit. That we become fruitful in Jesus' name. I call you blessed. Uh, congregation, stay a little while. I've got a few announcements. Amen. Hallelujah.